Alex Zhevorankov will now talk on new economic arguments for accelerating aging research. Alex. Thank you, Robert. Uh, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Alex Zhevorankov, and I'm involved uh, with a few projects relating to aging research. I'm a big fan and supporter of SANS. Uh, one of those projects uh, that you probably should take a note of is called the uh, Aging Portfolio. It's uh, one of the world's largest databases of biomedical grant data. We track about a trillion dollars worth of biomedical financing and try to groom it into categories related to aging research. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the economics of aging, but before I start, uh, here is an arbitrary chart of a person's lifeline. So uh, we uh, were born, we grow, we develop, we reach our peak, and we continuously decline. So aging is very bad, and it it, at some point of time, uh, we reach a threshold where we can no longer work. And the government sets uh, a threshold for us after which we start receiving uh, social security and uh, in increased uh, health care benefits and in some countries uh, it's actually mandatory to retire. So um, extending the retirement age uh, may be very beneficial for both the governments and maybe the individuals because they would want to try and use some preventative measures. And of course prevention is not going to uh, uh, completely um, eliminate the loss of function due to age the only way you can do it is through intervention. And at some point of time, hopefully, we're going to get to sense. So here is a graph. Uh, uh, it's an abstract chart of um, human development over the past six, 600 <coughs> years. I made it for the book, actually. Uh, and um, you can clearly see that it took us 400 years for the population to double from half a billion to a billion. That another 160 years to double from a billion to two billion, and then 50 years for the population to triple uh, from two billion to uh, six billion. Right now it's where seven billion. And most of the advances in the uh, human history also happened over the past 50 years. So some of those advances have not yet propagated into the mainstream use. We uh, do not. Uh, really pick up the fruits of research in uh, regenerative medicine, uh, but they are slowly moving through the pipeline, and hopefully uh, we're going to see um, increased lives. Also, on the funding side, uh, there is a huge, the vast increase in uh, the amount of biomedical spending over time uh, going into uh, all areas of biomedical sciences, mostly that's clinical trials actually if you uh, look under the hood um, uh, in the biomedical funding. And uh, there is usually a gap of several years before the dollar is spent and the first paper on the subject is published. So you can see that the uh, slope here is uh, much, well here the slope is much uh, steeper than in a publication domain. Most likely we're going to see uh, biomedical literature uh, to have a boost, uh, we will see an exponential curve uh, going forward. So that development uh, in the biomedical sciences uh, is probably yielding some uh, longevity dividends. And uh, unfortunately, those longevity dividends fall in the last few uh, decades of the pre uh, people's lifespan. So uh, doctors just don't let people die in the hospitals. Um, and that yields uh, this kind of diagram. So this is CDC statistics, Center for Disease Control. So it's very conservative estimates for 2030. Uh, this little group is baby boomers. And they are progressing um, through the demographic uh, uh, age ranges and are going to comprise a very significant chunk of the population in 2030. And that's, again, very conservative. We expect that it's probably going to be much more and just recently we did uh, a few simulations on how uh, various advances in biomedical sciences may affect the demographics in the U.S. Uh, and uh, we also evaluated um, uh, what's called the net present value of fiscal imbalance uh, triggered by that uh, uh, shift in demographics and published a paper in pensions. 
Um, we also looked at some of the very notable uh, and established economists like uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff, uh, Gokulis Matters. Uh, they conservatively published um, several studies where, uh, several conservative studies where they uh, predict that uh, they um, calculate the uh, uh, net present value of the unfunded liabilities to be around $44 trillion in the U.S. alone. That compared to net, uh, uh, national debt in the U.S., $16 trillion, that's what's currently being discussed very actively, that's uh, a very huge amount. And actually, um, uh, Kotlikov just recently published a few uh, papers where that uh, amount of unfunded fiscal li uh, liabilities is um, somewhere in the range of 300 uh, trillion, which is an uh, enormous amount of money. I'm not sure if U.S. would be able to ever cover that. Many notable economists already uh, raised the red flags. So again, Kotlikov, um, almost every notable economist is uh, predicting a crash nowadays. Um, so those are the books to read, actually. <laughs> and uh, if after you read all those books, it's actually pretty uh, nice evening reading, uh, you see that some of the recommendations that those economists are proposing uh, mostly center around uh, austerity measures, so basically cutting spending, uh, increased transparency and accountability, especially in the EU, wealth dis redistribution, so get the rich and spend to the poor, uh, linking currency to physical assets, so uh, investing in gold. Uh, some of the economists are uh, suggesting increased spending, and specifically on technology, and that's good. Uh, and some of the uh, economists are proposing investing in envir environmental uh, programs and clean energy. Uh, I agree to that, but probably more, much more urgently we should invest in aging research to accelerate it. So um, we decided to look at the history of economic theory uh, over the course of uh, human development. And as you can see, well, uh, this graph is basically, again, arbitrary. Um, the economic th theory moved from uh, land-based and value uh, and um, property-based models to uh, models that are abstracted from the physical world. So we are mostly now looking at uh, labor, demographics, technology, um, and uh, uh, we basically decided to use the neoclassical economics framework and try and put together a, a productive lifespan model which, um, again, uses the uh, uh, classic uh, solo model as a basic framework, but <coughs> takes main assumptions from the overlapping generations model. Uh, it's a very established model, uh, and life cycle theory of saving behavior, but adding some new parameters. So we added a few parameters. One is called the rejuvenation rate. Uh, that's basically the sum of all factors leading to um, the restoration of lost function due to age and the non-rejuvenating rate of biomedical pro progress uh, that is basically the rate of biomedical and technology progress that it extends the lifespan but does not extend the productive lifespan an example would be uh, extending uh, life of a patient on a deathbed using a therapeutic cancer vaccine uh, let's say by four months versus the uh, next best uh, method of uh, care, uh, and spending two, three hundred thousand dollars just to get that four months. Uh, at that time, the person is not contributing to the economy. It's not negative. Well, actually, if the, uh, the person is contributing to the economy, the patient is contributing to the economy because uh, uh, the doctors are um, also getting paid, and the uh, whole biomedical pipeline is moving. Uh, but to the general economy, it's not negative. So some other parameters, uh, we look at age, uh, as is the retirement age, um, and uh, we look at the maximum productive age, uh, and some functions using those uh, new parameters. Uh, so there is a function uh, of the number of people uh, aged A in period T, and that depends on the biomedical uh, technology progress rate. We look at the productivity of labor. Another very important uh, parameter is the propagand propagation uh, of the biomedical advances into mainstream use. 
So, for example, if you look at even aspirin today, uh, it took uh, aspirin more than 100 years to propagate into preventative uh, drugs. So basically we figured out uh, uh, the right dose and started using it as a cardio uh, <coughs> protective uh, drug. And now it's probably an onco protector, uh, but it takes a lot of time, even after it gets through regulatory approvals. So uh, we looked at a few, um, again, classical frameworks, and uh, in our model, <coughs> the employment, uh, the ratio of working age people to the total, to total number of people is described by this uh, work rate function. So from 16 to 24, 25, uh, um, we get a steady uh, increase of the working population, so people start working uh, early. Uh, then at 25, uh, from 25 to the uh, age of retirement, uh, we get uh, a very stable flat rate increase, almost. Then we've got uh, an exponential decline uh, in the labor force uh, from the retirement age to the biological retirement age, what we speak, is that uh, what we call it? Is the uh, um, age at which the ability to do useful work is diminished. Uh, and afterward, some people continue working till they die. Um, here, this rate is accelerated. So the mortality rate, again, depends on the uh, biomedical um, and technology progress rate and the rate of propagation of those technologies uh, into the clinic. Um, productivity of workers is not constant and depends on age. So here you've got the Poisson distribution, you've got the bell curve. Uh, and households um, uh, aged, uh, um, well, the, the households before, uh, after the retirement, uh, start withdrawing from uh, the labor force and start uh, to receive the public benefits and social security and the health care benefits. Um, the firm, uh, classically, uh, is a classic Cobb Douglas function um, and it tries to maximize its profit. Uh, it also depends a little bit on the labor, well, a lot on labor, which depends on the biomedical uh, uh, progress rate. Uh, households are assumed to be rational, they have uh, perfect foresight, uh, and uh, there are no altruistic models. And again, the production uh, function is called Douglas. Competitive equilibrium, uh, households maximize their lifetime utility, and the firm maximizes its profit. Uh, so, biomedical, uh, and, uh, biomedical technology progress rate, it shifts uh, the mortality rate here. So basically, this is uh, uh, the mortality rate with a biomedical prog uh, technology progress rate. Uh, this is just the mortality rate. Productivity, we assume that the productivity uh, of workers depends on age. And uh, the productivity of teens is lower as uh, we get, uh, as the uh, rejuvenation rate accelerates, um, the productivity of workers also increases. So I'm not talking about human augmentation, but uh, in this case here, uh, people will be able to stay in the sc at school a little bit longer if the productive health plan uh, is increased uh, and thereby increase their, uh, um, increase their productivity. And perhaps uh, we're talking not only about biomedical uh, progress rate, but it's also technology progress rate, so technology also increases productivity. So just to visualize what I'm saying, because currently there's a lot of formulas and I'm trying not to go deep enough, I can criticize them later. Um, imagine that there are three points in life, right? So seven ages of men, but here we have the last three. So uh, we've got a retirement age set by the government. We've got the healthy productive age and the age of death. We have the biomedical progress rate, which uh, shifts both the healthy productive age and the age of death uh, forward, but it consists of two rates essentially. One is the rejuvenating rejuvenation rate, which increases the healthy productive age, um, and the uh, non-rejuvenating biomedical progress rate. So that shifts the age of death, but doesn't increase the healthy productive age. So in our model, the economy will grow if the rejuvenation rate is 
faster is greater than the non-rejuvenation rejuvenating biomedical progress rate. Or uh, the retirement age is increased uh, faster or at least at the same rate uh, as the difference between those two rates. So what does it mean for our economy uh, going forward? Uh, again, since we have a lot of residual progress uh, in the biomedical uh, world uh, coming from, uh, stemming from uh, a lot of funding, and the funding uh, was mostly done by the uh, pharmaceutical companies that were trying to focus, due to the regulatory uh, environment, trying to focus on the last few years of life uh, of a patient, uh, trying to keep the patient alive, so we're talking about most critical cases. It's much more, uh, it's much easier to enroll patients uh, into clinical trials when um, they are already on their deathbed. Um, and if you show efficacy, you can get uh, insurance money for it. So the pipeline of the um, of the mo most of the pharmaceutical companies is actually focused not on prevention and not on extension extending the health productive lifespan. So they are not focusing on rejuvenation rate. Uh, but they are trying to focus more on the non-rejuvenating uh, biomedical progress rate. So there are two scenarios. We can either grow uh, as the economy if we refocus our activities on uh, the rejuvenation rate and also try to implement things like lifelong learning and lifelong career planning, uh, proactively increase the uh, retirement age and again focus more uh, funding more resources on aging research versus trying to treat the diseases. Uh, there is a very high probability of an economic decline uh, because uh, more people uh, will now enjoy the fruits of uh, biomedical progress uh, in the form of the extension of the last few years of life. Um, and there is a possibility of global economic collapse because, well, at some point of time, uh, everybody will realize that the U.S. would not be able to pay its debt uh, and the unfunded liabilities to its own population. And uh, uh, on the top of the pyramid, if any one of the large countries will stop buying the debt or start selling, we're going to have a collapse of the currency. So recommendations, our recommendations are very different from uh, any other uh, uh, economist recommendation. Uh, we are trying to actually uh, motivate policymakers to uh, focus on accelerating the aging research uh, and focusing more on increasing the healthy, productive uh, uh, re uh, research um, and uh, refocusing the healthcare from focusing on last mile treatments uh, to preventative and uh, life extending medicine. Two minutes. Yes. Uh, and of course, we need to find ways, new ways, to accelerate the propagation of some of the laboratory discoveries in the clinic and mainstream use, because the pipeline is full of uh, those discoveries that may have life extending uh, capacity. We just need to deliver them to patients sooner. Then we probably will be able to outpace the non rejuvenating biomedical <coughs> progress rate. So I would like to thank my collaborator, Maria Lutovchenko, from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, who is very deeply involved in the, the math of the project. And uh, thank you all. Questions?